Hi class, today I want to talk about biology and the characteristics of life. So since biology is life and the study of living things, which you probably already know, it kind of brings up a question of, well, then what actually makes something living compared to non-living? And so we're going to go over, there's usually a list of defined characteristics that is used to define whether or not something is living. So I have this little acronym for you, and it's called dog race, and each letter is going to stand for one of the characteristics of a living organism. And so I put these cute pictures of a dog or dogs racing to help you remember. I couldn't, look at, look how cute, they have a hot dog dog race, and they have their cute little buns over there. All right, so the characteristics of life. The first one is DNA. All living things have DNA. All living things are organized. All living things grow and develop. So there's your dog. The race, all living things can reproduce. They could adapt and respond. They're made of cells and they need energy. And so if you remember dog race, and we'll talk about each one of these and why they're important. And then usually throughout the year, we'll have a chapter pretty much on each one of these, touching and going into the details a lot more. So let's talk about DNA. DNA, of course, is your genetic material. We have a whole chapter learning about its structure. And if you look at its structure over here, we actually didn't know it looked like this until 1953. And so, you know, DNA is a, considering science overall, is a relatively new thing that we're able to kind of figure out and how important it really is. So we're gonna study its structure. It looks kind of complex, but overall, it has the same five or six repeating parts that just repeat over and over and over. But DNA is usually coiled up into these little structures called chromosomes, which you may have heard of about. We have, as humans, have 46 chromosomes, half from mom and half from dad. And these chromosomes are DNA, and DNA makes you the person that you are. It makes every living thing the person that they are, not, well, the organism that they are. All DNA in all organisms has this same structure. No matter if it's a bacteria, an ant, or an elephant, or you, all DNA looks the same in every organism, and that's amazing. It controls the traits for why an organism is and does the things that it does. So we're going to talk about inheriting those traits in the genetics in DNA chapter. All living things are organized. This just means that they have to be organized in order to, effici to efficiently survive. So if they're not efficient, they're not going to survive. I'm going to talk about this in the next video, more detail, but I'm going to show you an example with this cell and how it's very organized. So this cell, if you look at the cell, and I know that you studied cells before, it has a nucleus, it has a rough ER and the smooth ER, and the Golgi, and all these cell parts inside. Well, each one of those cell parts, as you may know, has a specific job. And if one of those parts doesn't do its job, then the whole cell could potentially not function and die. And so high organization is necessary in order for survival. The next thing that we have is that all living things have to grow and develop. Growth means getting bigger and development means changing shape or form. And so the example of growth is with the zygote. This is a zygote, that's when an egg and a sperm first unite, and that's what you look like. But we know that you're much more than a single cell right now. Well, there's a growth and development that happens. The growth is first it splits into two, and then the four cells, and then a big clump of cells. And so eventually you get bigger because you make a bigger clump of cells. But over time, there's obviously a lot of development. Development means that there's going to be a lot of changes in shape and form. So these cells are called stem cells. That just means that they don't have a specific thing to do. They're not a certain type of cell yet. But they will become specific types of cells through development and something called specialization. They will become brain cells, heart cells, bone cells, blood cells, and all the cells inside of you. They will specialize and change in shape and form to do a job that they were designed to do. Over here, we have metamorphosis of a butterfly, which shows development as well. So we have the egg, which turns into the caterpillar, the larval form, which turns into the pupa, which is encased in the chrysalis and then eventually breaks out and forms the adult butterfly. And so that's a, that's a very obvious change in shape or form. Um, the frogs do the same thing as do many organisms. So growth and development. The next thing is reproduction, is just passing on traits to your offspring. And this can be done in one of two different ways. It could be done asexually or it could be done sexually. So in asexual reproduction, as you may know, it is a cloning process. 
and you only need one parent, and that parent or organism will create clones of itself. And so you only need one parent, and the offspring are genetically identical to the parent. So again, asexual reproduction is one parent, and the offspring are genetically identical to the parent. That can be done in many different ways, and in, this is a paramecium that actually splits into two, and these offspring down here are, gene are genetic copies of what the parent was, and that's called binary fission, that splitting into two. This picture over here is also asexual. This is an aquatic animal called a hydra. Hydras live in fresh water, like ponds, and they don't split into two. They, instead, they grow a little mini miniature version of themselves off of the body, and so this is called budding. And this is a genetically identical offspring of the original parent, and then it will grow in size and develop later on. The other type of reproduction is sexual reproduction, and that's a preferred method for over 99% of all life on this planet, and that's because it allows for genetic variety. So in sexual reproduction, you have two parents, and it allows the offspring to be genetically different from one another. So genetic variety. And usually you need an egg and a sperm from the male and the female, and the egg and sperm, they mix up the DNA once they unite, and it causes different combinations of genes. And those that different combination cause, it happens differently every single time, and therefore everything, every single offspring is just a little bit different. And that creates genetic variety. Why does that seem like a good thing? That's because if you have a successful virus that comes along and you're all clones of one another, then the virus will wipe out your species and you'll go extinct. But if you're a little bit different than your parents and other siblings and other of your species, well, then when a virus comes along, maybe some of them will die, but some of them will survive. And so it allows for survival and reproduction to have genetic variety. All right, the next thing that living things could do is adapt and respond to the environment. So they have to be able to detect changes and respond accordingly. So an adaptation, an adaptation is simply a trait that helps an organism survive and reproduce. A trait that helps an organism survive and reproduce. A response is usually just, it's a reaction to things around you or inside you. Living things have to be able to do both. And either you're, a, you're well adapted to respond or you're not well adapted to respond and you could potentially die. This is an example of a type of moth called the peppered moth and there's a dark version and a light version. Same species but just two different colored versions. And before the Industrial Revolution what happened was there's a whole lot of the light colored version because they were well adapted. They were hiding from predators because they blended in to their background which was mainly trees at the time. And then the dark colored version of the moth it stuck out more just because it was a different color and so a lot of predators were able to spot it and eat it more frequently. That doesn't mean they were all eaten but they were just eaten more frequently and the light ones were eaten less, less frequently. And so this shows good adaptations or maybe not so good adaptations for their environment. But if the environment changes such as it did during the Industrial Revolution so this is pre-industrial revolution, post-industrial revolution, when all the smokestacks were making tons of pollution and the pollution was causing everything to be dingy and dirty, it covered up the trees and made them darker. And so that means that the adaptation that was better was a dark one because they were now able to blend and the light one, not so much. And so you st started to see more dark colored moths and less light colored moths. And that change over the time is called evolution. And we have a whole chapter on this later in the year. Another exam example of responding to the environment is with plant growth. Plants grow towards the light, you may know that. That's a phenomenon called phototropism. So you can see how it's bending towards the light, and if you turn it around and it's bent away from the light, over time it will bend towards the light again. Same thing, they like to grow against gravity, and so they grow up. But if you put the plant on its side, it will actually turn and start to grow upward again, and that's responding to the environment as is touching something that's hot. I mean, you're gonna to respond to that as well. So you have to detect changes around you and respond accordingly. All living things are made of cells. Cells are the basic unit of life. Nothing smaller than a cell can be considered alive. And so living things are made out of either one cell or more than one cell. 
one cell is called unicellular and many cells is called multicellular. We are multicellular, plants are multicellular, fungi are multicellular, and some protists are multicellular. This is a plant called Elodea. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like under a microscope. You could see lots of cells right there, multicellular. This is a paramecium. It's a single cell protist, and paramecium are unicellular. But all living things contain cells, at least one or more. And all living things need energy. You have to obtain and use that energy. So to obtain the energy, you could be either an autotroph and make your own, you're a producer. So autotrophs are producer, usually by photosynthesis. Heterotrophs are consumers. So you have to go out and find a food source. And so we are heterotrophs. Those are your carnivores, your herbivores, your omnivores, your decomposers, etc. So they're heterotrophs. Um, why do you need energy? It's because you have to run your metabolism. Metabolism, that is all the chemical reactions within an organism. Your metabolism, or any organism's metabolism, are all the chemical reactions within an organism. And so if you look at this picture down here, the reason that we eat food is to run our metabolism, all the chemical reactions with inside of us. So we eat food, carbs, lipids, proteins, and what do we do with them? Well, we break them down. When we break them down, we use those, that food, that energy that we absorb to actually make an energy source for our body called ATP. And so we don't use food directly, we actually have to convert it into a molecule called ATP, and we'll talk about ATP later, but ATP is able to run our metabolism and all the chemical reactions and make us survive. Of course, with any energy, you have waste, and so you have chemical waste, and you have heat waste, you have uh, excrement as waste, so there are way, if you take an energy input, you have some output as well. The last thing I want you to know about energy is that that energy in your metabolism is used to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis means a stable internal environment. Homeostasis is a stable internal environment. So homeo means same, stasis means to stand. So standing at the same state inside. You want to be at a balance point. You want to be in a happy place. For example, if your temperature is not 98, degrees, give or take, then you're out of homeostasis. You could have a fever, and that could indicate an illness. If you um, have a high blood pressure or low blood pressure, you're not in homeostasis. You want 120 over 80 to be your blood pressure. If you have too much sugar in your blood, then you're not in homeostasis, and so your body's going to find a way through your metabolism to correct that, and therefore they're going to release insulin and remove the sugar. So there's tons of ways to maintain homeostasis which means the happy place of your body, the internal steady state of where your body needs to be to function properly. And so that is homeostasis and energy use. So hopefully you remember these. Remember dog race. DNA, organize, grow and develop, reproduce, adapt and respond, made of cells, and energy. Those are the characteristics that make something alive.